So this video is going to introduce compound multiplets and explain how we can use splitting trees to interpret the multiplicity of our signals. So in the previous video, we talked about what coupling was and what causes it, and how we can categorize our signals into a number of different uh, categories. So either singlets, where we don't have any coupling, simple multiplet, where we're coupling to one other chemical environment, compound multiplets, where we're coupling to more than one other chemical environment, or complex multiplet, where there's something else going on, such as signal overlap. So this video is going to focus on compound multiplets, and the example I gave in the previous video was this proton here in purple, uh, which has two chemical environments, uh, one to either side of it. So because these two chemical environments are different from each other, when the red proton or the purple proton couples to these two environments, um, it will do so to form a compound multiplet. So in a compound multiplet, we basically treat it the same way as a simple multiplet. It's just that we couple to each of the chemical environments in turn. And each of these couplings could have um, a different J constant, or it could have the same J constant, but it would be coincidental if it did. So starting out by looking at the coupling of proton A with proton B, you would expect this to be a doublet, um, based on the M plus 1 rule as we saw previously. And if you were to couple HA to HC, you would expect that to be a triplet, because there are two equivalent protons in that chemical environment. So Essentially, all we do is to work out the, the final signal, it's a combination of the couplings and the constituent J values. So in this case, we would end up with a doublet of triplets. And that's what we can see in this signal down here. Um, this is the, the nomenclature that you typically see in, in research papers and that kind of thing. So we discussed this in the previous video. Um, so the 3J AB coupling, which is a three bond um, coupling between A and B, um, and then the magnitude of the J value in Hertz, and the same for AC. So one way that we can understand and interpret uh, the multiplicity of our signals is using splitting trees. So I'm going to show you how these work, and we're going to start with the, th the splitting tree for signal A. So we can see that we've got our J values up here, so we'll be able to insert these into the splitting tree and predict what the signal is going to look like. So if we start out with our uncoupled signal for A, now you'll notice that the x-axis down here is in delta J. So this is measured in hertz, and it's basically going to allow us to work out the magnitude of our, or reflect the magnitude of our J values. So um, notice it's not in chemical shift. So the, the chemical shift of this signal is given up here as 6.82. So when you're seeing this signal on the actual NMR spectrum, um, the center of this uh, this signal will be 6.82, and then the magnitude of the J values obviously is given in Hertz. So what we're going to do is we're going to show the couplings to each of these three um, protons individually. So I tend to start with the largest coupling, and that's the one between A and B in this case, but I'll show you later, it doesn't really matter which you do first. So starting out with the 3J AB coupling, it's a 17.1 Hertz magnitude coupling. So we show this splitting on the splitting tree like this. Now notice that you haven't gone 17.1 hertz in one direction and 17.1 hertz in the other. You've gone half of 17.1 in one direction and half of 17.1 in the other, so that the gap between the two signals is 17.1 hertz. Now, if protons C weren't here, if the molecule stopped here, or there was something blocking this position, this is what your signal would look like, because HA would just be coupling with HB, it would give a simple multiplet, in this case a doublet, and you'd have a one-to-one -one doublet, where the gap between the two um, peaks in the signal was 17.1 hertz. But HC does exist, they are here, so we're going to have to couple against those as well. And whenever you've got multiple equivalent protons, you couple against both of them individually. That's just how splitting trees work. So let's start with the first one. Uh, the magnitude of the J value now is 7.5 hertz, so we need to take these two signals that we've just created and split them again by 7.5 hertz this time. So again, go half of 7.5 in one direction and half of 7.5 in the other, so that the gap between the signals is 7.5 hertz. So now what we need to do, that's our first splitting, we need to split again against the second one. So we need to split all of these signals again by 7.5 hertz. And what you'll notice now is because we've split 7.5 hertz here and 7.5 hertz here, uh, this is our second coupling, 
two of our signals have coalesced here. And if you remember when we saw Pascal's triangle on the previous video, we add these signals together to get our signal intensity. So we have a signal intensity of one over here and a signal intensity of one here. They've come together and coalesced. So this signal here will have an intensity that's twice as high. And I'm going to denote that just by using a double asterisk in this case. And you'll notice that it's happened again over here. So we'll denote that with a double asterisk. So if we look at what our signal actually looks like, we need to make these signals twice as intense. So our, si our final signal will look something like this on our actual NMR spectrum. And if we look back at what it looks like, we've got a 1 to 2 to 1 triplet, and then a 1 to 2 to 1 triplet, and they're split by the second J value, which is that of the, the doublet, if you like. Uh, but this is reflected in our splitting tree. So our splitting tree has allowed us to predict what our signal is going to look like, just given the J values that we've got up here. So the beauty of splitting trees um, is it doesn't matter which order you do the splittings in. So I always tend to start with the, the largest splittings and go down to the smallest because it makes your tree uh, neater and sort of easier to interpret, but it really doesn't matter which order you want to do them in. So if we start with the couplings to HC, this is the first one, and then we need to split against the second one. So this gives us a triplet at this stage. So if, if HB wasn't here, you know, uh, proton A would give us a triplet because it's coupling to these two equivalent protons C. Um, but HB is here, so let's do the final coupling to HB. And we split all of these signals by now by 17.1 hertz. Uh, remembering that any signals that are twice as intense need to be reflected in the final product. So if we look at our final signal, it looks exactly the same as what we had before. And just to really prove a point, um, if we do the signals in a really weird order, so we do one of our HCs, then HB, then the other HC, then the signal that we end up with from our splitting tree is once again exactly the same. So if we make the situation a bit more complex, all I've done is shorten the molecule by one carbon so that HC is now an environment with three equivalent protons in it. And you can see that the signal has got more complex. And we're now starting to get into signals where you might look at them and go, well, you know, I can't really interpret what that is. So the splitting tree is going to allow us to work out what peaks have come from where and where our J values are in this signal. So same principle as before. Let's start by coupling against HB. That's again a 17.1 hertz gap. I've kept all the J values the same for simplicity. And we're then going to couple against three HCs. So that's the first splitting. Then we've got the second splitting, remembering that we're getting a signal that's twice as intense here now. And then we're going to get a third splitting of these signals against the final HC. Now, look in, the, in, this, in this scenario here, we've got a signal which is twice as intense, meeting one that's um, a single intensity, if you like. So this adds up to three. So we've got all of these scenarios where a signal which is twice as intense as a meta-standard signal, if you like, and we've got now signals which are three times as intense. So if we look at what our signal looks like, we've got this 1 to 3 to 3 to 1 quartet and a 1 to 3 to 3 to 1 quartet, which is exactly what we've got in the signal over here. Um, because we've constructed this using a splitting tree, it becomes a little bit easier to see. So you can see that um, the, the area where the signals overlap here um, could get a bit confusing, but you can see now there's evenly spaced gaps between these four signals, which is one of the quartets, and evenly spaced gaps between these four signals, which is one of the other, which is the second quartet. Now, one of the scenarios that um, splitting trees allow us to, to, to clear up um, is where we've got uh, signals that should theoretically be something but look like something else. Um, and that's where signals start to coalesce with one another or they overlap. So if we take this simple example here, um, we're going to take uh, HC, which is the, the para position of a, of a phenyl ring, um, and we're going to see how it couples to HB. So this is actually a simple multiplet. So there is one J value here, and as you'd expect, HC gives you a triplet because you've got an HB on both sides. So if we split against the first HB, we've got a 7.8 splitting. And then if we split against the seven, second um, HB, again, we've got a 7.8 splitting. We meet in the middle to get a signal that's twice as intense. So our overall signal is a 1 to 2 to 1 triplet. And that is a simple multiplet. So you can see splitting trees work exactly the same for simple multiplets. No problems there. 
So what happens if we move to this scenario now? Well, you'll see in a lot of you know, research articles and even textbooks and things like that, um, positions like HB described as being a triplet, which if you're following the n plus one rule is technically correct. There's two protons that it's coupling to. But as I described at the beginning of the video, these two environments are not the same, right? This is ortho to the amine group and this is para. So these are not equivalent protons. They're not in the same chemical environment. So this is not a simple multiplet. Um, what it is is a compound multiplet. But quite often what you'll see it described as and what I, the terminology that I tend to use is apparent triplet. So this is a signal which looks like a triplet um, and that's just because of the limitations of the spectrometer or coincidence, but it's not really. So if we look at the J values we've got, B coupling to A is 7.6 hertz, B coupling to C is 7.8 hertz. So they're very, very similar J values. Um, these could be identical, um, but I'm going to show you what happens when they're just very similar. So if we start by coupling to HA, uh, we've got 7.6 hertz coupling here, and then we're going to split everything again, again by HC. Now, because this J value is ever so slightly different, these two signals don't quite coalesce in the middle. If this was 7.6 hertz, they absolutely would, and that would be, it'd look like a normal triplet. So you can see, technically what we've got here is a doublet of doublets, but these two signals in the middle are very, very close together. And what our signal actually looks like is a triplet. So what I'm trying to say here is that technically speaking, HB should give you a doublet of doublets. But by pure coincidence or just the, you know, the situation that it's in, the two J values that it's coupling to HA and HC with are very, very similar. They could even be identical. Um, so what you end up with is a signal that looks like a triplet because if you had a perfect spectrometer which had infinite resolution, it would be able to tell these two signals apart, and you would say clearly that's a doublet of doublets. But we don't have a perfect spectrometer with infinite resolution, so the spectrometer cannot tell these two signals apart, so all you end up with is a coalesced signal in the middle, which again looks like a triplet. So this is an apparent triplet, and all you're saying is I understand that HB shouldn't te technically give me a triplet, um, but it looks like one. Um, technically, it's a doublet of doublets, but you wouldn't report it that way. You would say it's an apparent triplet. So let's move on to a really complicated looking example now, and let's see how we can reverse engineer a signal using splitting trees. So this signal down here is the one for HB, and you know, if you look at it, it looks fairly horrendous. You, you wouldn't necessarily be able to tell me off the top of your head what that signal is. But let's have a look at it on the on the scale, if you like. So what we're going to look for in this signal is any kind of repeat patterns and anywhere that there is a repeat um, unit of something. Now, if you look down the zero, uh, the axis, if you like, you can see that the signal is symmetrical on both sides. So everything on this side of the signal is reflected in everything on this side of the signal. And that's usually a good sign that your signal is going to be interpretable in this way. So the first thing that um, I'd notice when looking at this signal is that there's kind of a triplet pattern here. And if you start to measure the J values between these signals, um, if you can find any J values that are repeated, it's usually a good sign that they're actually a legitimate J value rather than just a coincidental um, gap between two signals. Now, because the signal is symmetrical, this triplet pattern over here is reflected um, in this, this side of the, of the signal. So if we're looking at HB, obviously we've got the two equivalent HA protons, so this is a good indication that this is probably the triplet that's coming from HA. So in the middle it gets a little bit more complicated um, because we've got these, signal, these two signals here which look a little bit oddly shaped, they're a bit, um, bit broad. So we've extrapolated one of our coupling constants, we, we know we're looking for something with 6.2 hertz we think. Um, but if we look in the middle of this signal, then we can trace the same triplet pattern with the same 6.2 hertz gaps into these signals here. And assuming that these two are overlaid, then that would explain why they look a bit strange. So what we're going to do next is start to look for some of the other J values, because obviously we're expecting we've got a 6.2 hertz triplet coupling to HA, but we're also going to have to look for a doublet coupling to HC and a doublet coupling to HD. So if we start measuring the gaps between the triplets, so I'm measuring the gap here between the left peak of this purple triplet 
and the left peak of this green triplet. And this is 10 hertz, exactly. Um, if we start to measure again, symmetrically on the other side, right, the rightmost signal of this um, red triplet and the rightmost signal of this orange one, that gap is also 10 hertz. So the fact that it's reflected and there's a consistent J value there tends to suggest it's probably a legitimate one. So we're looking for a 10 hertz doublet coupling as well. Now, if we measure the gap between the leftmost signal of the purple triplet and the leftmost signal of the orange triplet, that gives us a gap of 16.8 hertz. And once again, you can do this with any of the other signals. Um, it should be reflected in all of them. Um, so that gives us uh, another of our J values. So remember, when you're looking at these things, the gap between the adjacent peaks in this case um, gives us that triplet um, J value, but we're looking at the the consistent peaks in all of these patterns. So the left, you're measuring from the left signal of this triplet to the left signal of that triplet and so on. So you wouldn't measure from the left signal of this triplet to the right signal of that triplet. That's that's not a legitimate J value. That's just nonsense. So if we reverse engineer this and we go back into our splitting tree, uh, we're going to take our three J values and we're going to convert them um, into our splitting tree. So I'm going to start with the biggest one, 3JB to C, which is 16.8 hertz, and then 10 hertz and 6.2. And if we do the splittings as we've seen previously, so we split the, the singlet by 16.8 hertz to give us a doublet that's got a J value of 16.8. If we then go against HD and split those two signals, we've now got a doublet of doublets, which is 16.8 and 10 hertz. And finally, if we split against HA, again, do them one at a time. So against the first one, and then against the second one, remembering to add up all of our uh, coalescing peaks, so these are twice as intense, we end up with something that looks a bit complex down here. Um, but actually, if we look at the, the signal, um, it looks reasonably similar to what we've got over here. The only bit that differs is the, the bit in the middle where we've got these two signals. But as we saw in the previous example, uh, that's a limitation of the spectrometer. It just can't resolve lines that are this close together. So if we overlay our signal on top of our splitting tree, actually it predicts perfectly what our signal looks like. It's just that these signals in the middle are these two lines coalesced into one another. So the other way that we can um, work out some of the J values that are in the signal for HB, because um, I appreciate looking at HB on its own is quite challenging, unless you know what you're looking for, Bear in mind that HB is coupling to H's A, C, and D. And whenever a proton couples with another proton in a different chemical environment, the J values in both of those signals are identical. So we can look at the other signals for HC, HD, and HA, and we can try and extract some J values from them. So if we look at the signal for HC, um, these two uh, kind of multiplets here are 16.8 hertz apart, again measuring from the leftmost peak of one to the leftmost peak of the other. So that backs up what we found in this signal, right? That's the J value that we found in this signal, just reflected in the signal for HC. Similarly, if we do HD, these two signals are now 10 hertz apart, and again that's reflected in the signal that we the, the gap that we found in the signal for HB. And finally, if we look at the signal for HA, the gap between these two is 6.2 hertz apart in this doublet. And that's exactly what we found in the triplet signal or the triplet pattern in the signal for HP. So don't just look at the signal that you're trying to interpret, um, work out what it's coupling to and then try and extrapolate some J values from there. Um, and that will help you to work out what's going on in the more complex multiplets in your spectrum. So all of this has basically allowed us to get rid of that, uh, that multiplet. So we don't have to just describe it as a multiplet anymore and say, oh, I don't understand what's going on here, just multiplet. Um, we could actually use a splitting tree to help us. And we know now that this is a double doublet of triplets. And here are our J values that we've worked out are part of it.